Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is in continuation with the uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease series. This is the fourth and the final part of uh, this series where I'll be discussing about asthma. In the earlier sessions, we had discussed about emphysema, chronic bronchitis, bronchitis, Ectasis, and today we will discuss in detail about asthma. We will look into the definition, the pathogenesis, clinical features, morphology. What is asthma? Asthma is a heterogeneous disease. Heterogeneous means there is no single etiology for this particular disease, right? It has several etiologies for the development of asthma. So, it is a heterogeneous disease which is characterized by chronic airway inflammation and variable amounts of expiratory air, air flow obstruction. Remember, chronic airway inflammation accompanied by expiratory air flow obstruction which produces clinical symptoms such as wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough which can vary over time and in intensity. So, that is the normal bronchi and this is the asthmatic bronchi for comparison. In this illustration itself, we can make out that there is some amount of inflammation here and there is a luminal obstruction by probably mucus secretion. We will discuss in detail about this a bit later. right? Now, uh, coming to the epidemi epidemiological aspects of asthma, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, that is CDC, tells that around 10% of the world's population suffers from asthma. It's a most common chronic respiratory disease in children. It's more common in children than adults. When you compare the incidence of asthma in children and adults, it's more common in children than adults. And majority, around 50 to 80 percent of them develop symptoms before five years of age. And approximately 80 percent of these patients, you know, they have allergic diathesis and positive skin test for allergens. That means atopia or allergy plays a very important role for the development of asthma. Now, moving on to understanding the types of asthma, broadly, uh, asthma can be classified or categorized into atopic asthma and non atopic asthma. Atopic meaning there is evidence of allergen sensitization and immune activation in this case, whereas non atopic, as the name says, there is no evidence of allergen sensitization. Okay. Atopic asthma develops often in patients with allergic rhinitis or eczema, which means there is some amount of allergen uh, sensitization or activation going on in these particular cases. This type of asthma is classically type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, which is immunoglobulin E mediated type. Right? This is type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Whereas non-atopic asthma, of course, they have you know manifestations of asthma like bronchoconstriction, and that bronchoconstriction is due to various triggers, which can be as simple as respiratory infections, like you know routine viral infections. It could be due to irritants like smoke, fumes, sulfur dioxide, ozone, etc., or it could be due to cold air. Stress or even exercise can induce bronchoconstriction, a bronchoconstriction or bronchospasms. So the two important uh, entities which you should know is the drug-induced asthma and occupational asthma. What is this drug-induced asthma? This is an aspirin-sensitive asthma where the asthma is triggered by in these patients by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase pathway. Aspirin inhibits the cyclooxygenase pathway, which leads to rapid decrease in the prostaglandin E2 levels, and that predisposes to the development of all these clinical manifestations of asthma like bronchoconstriction. Coming to occupational asthma, the mechanism is direct liberation of bronchoconstrictor substances okay, and hypersensitivity responses of unknown origin. Now, the Common examples for occupational asthma could be exposure to fumes like you know epoxy, resins or even plastic fumes. Could be due to exposure of organic and chemical dust like wood, cotton or even platinum, gases like toluene or even you know chemicals like formaldehyde or penicillin products. All these things can lead to development of asthma and that's why we can call these as the risk factors for development of asthma. Right. So, we understood the different types of asthma and various risk factors associated with asthma. Now, moving on to understanding the pathogenesis of asthma. 
Well, let's consider this is your normal uh, respiratory epithelium lining the bronchi and bronchioles. You have this pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and that's an antigen presenting cell. That's a goblet cell, a representation of goblet cell secreting mucus. Now, consider this is an allergen, okay? This is an allergen which the patient is exposed to. Now, we can discuss asthma pathogenesis in two phases. One is sensitization phase and then we'll talk about how these sensitized mucosa respond once they are re-exposed to these allergens right now the sensitization phase includes exposure of the allergen and this allergen is taken up by the antigen presenting cells See, once the antigen presenting cells presents the antigen to the T helper cells, what really happens is that the T helper cells releases lots of cytokines, which brings about lots of reaction. Now, look, we will look into one by one. One is release of interleukin 4 and interleukin 13. So, what does this do? This, you know, stimulates the B cells, and thereby B cells mature into plasma cell to produce antibodies called IgE antibodies. Right. So, the first important uh, um, reaction which happens is production of immunoglobulin E antibodies. Second one is the interleukin 5 which is produced by these T helper cells. They stimulate these eosinophils. The third one is interleukin 13 which helps in the proliferation as well as hypertrophy of the submucosal glands which leads to increase in the mucus secretion. Right. So, and once you have these IgE antibodies in the subepithelial region, the mast cells in the subepithelial region have receptor for these IgE antibodies. Okay. Now, all the IgE antibodies goes and binds on the receptor on the mast cells. And now, this is a sensitized mast cell, right? So, this is a sensitization phase. Now, let us consider a scenario where the sensitized mucosa is exposed to allergen again. Whenever there is a breach in the continuity of epithelium, like for example, ulcer on the mucosa, could be, you know, uh, due to exposure to fumes or uh, infections, viral infections or anything for that matter, whatever risk factors I have told you, what for, for whatever reason, if you find the breach in the continuity, these allergens can directly, you know, enter into the subepithelial and bind on to these sensitized muscles. Okay, that is very quick. So, once this sensitized mast cell binds to the allergen, so there is rapid, you know, degranulation of these mast cells. That's the immediate reaction. So, the mast cells, which is completely studded with granules, now degranulates. And what does happen when it is degranulated? It releases lots and lots of inflammatory mediators. Now, what do they do? Inflammatory mediators, you know, they cause bronchoconstriction. And the inflammatory mediators which brings about bronchoconstriction are the histamine, leukotriene C4, D4 and E4, okay. And it also results in vagal nerve stimulation, right. Now, the inflammatory mediators can also result in vasodilatation and because there is vasodilatation, we know that there could be increased vascular permeability because of increase of, and then there is increased plasma leak which results in edema. Okay. Now, the inflammatory mediators can also result in hypertrophy and hyperplasia of submucous glands. What happens when there is hyperplasia of submucous glands? More and more mucus is being secreted and that results in increased mucus secretion in the lumen as well. Right. So, this is the early phase upon re-exposure to allergen. As I told you, inflammatory mediators will also stimulate the subepithelial vagal receptors, which leads to bronchoconstriction. So, remember, bronchoconstriction is brought about by these histamine, leukotriene, C4D4E4, and also by the stimulation of vagal nerve. Let's talk about what really happens as a late phase phenomenon. The degranulated mast cells, you know, they continue to recruit more and more inflammatory cells. The mediators which are released from these degranulated mast cells, they continue to recruit more and more inflammatory cells. And these inflammatory cells can be eosinophils, neutrophils, histiocytes or macrophages and even lymphocytes. And remember, eosinophils are also recruited by, you know, by eotaxin, which is produced by the epithelial cells. Okay. So, more and more eosinophils are there in the submucosa or the subepithelial region. And this eosinophil, you know, they 
produce lots of major basic protein so it is a major basic protein which results in epithelial cell damage so all these things occur as a late phase phenomenon that is recruitment of more and more inflammatory cells and then you have a major basic protein by eosinophils causing epithelial cell damage question important is, will everyone exposed to allergens develop asthma now the answer to this question is no because for a person to develop asthma upon exposure to allergen he or she should be genetically susceptible okay and that brings to the concept of genetic susceptibility now what is this the the, uh, the locus for this susceptibility lies on the short arm of chromosome number 5 where there are lots of genes involved in regulation of ige synthesis okay there are genes involved in eosinophil and mast cell development and regulation okay so those are the genes located on the chromosome number 5 that particularly short arm and these are actually the clusters of genes encoding the cytokines interleukin 3 4 5 9 13 and the interleukin 4 receptors the most important one is the interleukin 13 receptor the effects on the interleukin 13 receptor The second important concept is there is something called airway hyperresponsiveness. Now, what is that? Which means there is excessive tendency of airways to contract too early. You know, they respond very very early and then results in bronchoconstriction. And the mechanism of this extreme airway hyperresponsiveness is actually not known. But then they think that it is because of inflammation there could be airway hyperresponsiveness. the third important one is the hygiene hypothesis where it says microbial exposure during early life you know it they say it reduces the later incidence of allergic diseases or even some amount of autoimmune diseases and that's the reason why asthma is more common in industrialized regions where industrialized society where the children or the kids are very less exposed to antigens they are always maintained uh, there is always maintenance of cleanliness and all those things right and that's why it said that it is they are more susceptible to asthma and this is a proposed mechanism that's the reason why people who are exposed to microbial antigen children or kids who are exposed to microbial antigen they are less susceptible to the development of asthma. so as per this hypothesis it's always good to allow your kids to play outside what is the morphological features of asthma grossly airways particularly the bronchi and bronchioles are fluted by plugs of and tenacious mucus plugs that's what you can easily appreciate so on microscopy you find the find evidence of increased mucus in the form of mucus plugs you can on these mucus plugs you know they take the shape of the smaller airways they are spiral shaped cars these are the spiral shaped cars and these are known as kirschman spirals and this is very commonly found in sputum of asthmatic patients these are kirschman spirals and you can also see lots of inflammatory cells we know the inflammatory cells are being recruited by the granules of the mast cells right so lots of inflammatory cells particularly more and more eosinophils and if you see more and more eosinophils you can also expect some amount of crystalloids which are derived from eosin of phil lysophospholipase binding protein and these crystalloids are called as charcot laden crystals and these are the hexagonal or rhomboid shaped crystals you can see here okay these are charcot laden crystals the third important morphological aspects of asthma is airway remodeling long standing cases of asthma you find evidence of airway remodeling and what is this airway remodeling airway re remodeling means you find there is hypertrophy or hyperplasia of the submucous glands there can be hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the bronchial smooth muscle and there is deposition of sub epithelial collagen which results in thickening of the basement membrane and this whole thing is known as airway remodeling right so compare that with the normal bronchi with the asthmatic bronchi the airway remodeling you can appreciate in the form of increased number of submucous glands lots and lots of bronchial smooth muscle you can find evidence of thick sputum in the lumen and lots of inflammatory cells including eosinophils right so that's airway remodeling so how do asthmatic patients manifest what are the clinical features a classic acute asthmatic attack last up to several hours several hours where they manifest with chest tightness dyspnea 
wheezing and coughing with or without sputum production. Whereas more severe form, that is acute severe asthma, you know, what happens here is that there is, there is paroxysm which persists for days or even weeks. Sometimes airflow obstruction is so severe and so extreme that marked cyanosis or even death can ensue in these cases. In this context, we can discuss complication of asthma that is status asthmaticus, which is an extreme form of asthma exacerbation, which is characterized by hypoxemia, hypercarbia and secondary respiratory failure. If this is not identified early and managed well, this can result in death of the patient. Okay, So that's why it's called extreme form of asthma exacerbation. Now, how do you diagnose asthma? Of course, you have a very classical clinical history. You have to demonstrate uh, increased airflow obstruction from the baseline levels. There will be difficulty with exhalation. That, that means prolonged expiration accompanied with V's. And in the peripheral blood, you can find evidence of eosinophil increase. There is eosinophilia. And on sputum examination, we saw already that you can see Gershman spirals or sarcoladen crystals. Remember, uh, eosinophilia is more commonly found in atopic asthma than non-atopic asthma. When you find lots and lots of eosinophils in the peripheral smear, it is almost always evident that this patient might probably be, an, a, be a patient of atopic asthma. Okay, so these are the two things which I've already explained. One is charcoal laden crystals, and second one is Kirschman spirals. These charcoal laden crystals are rhomboid to hexagonal structures, whereas Kirschman spirals are spiral shaped mucinous plugs. Now, how do you treat asthma? It depends upon the severity of uh, asthma. It, primary mode of treatment is using bronchodilators, use of corticosteroids, and leukotriene antagonist. Yes, you can also use interleukin-5 blocking antibodies, particularly when the asthma is more severe and it is difficult to treat asthma and asthma in adolescents and adults. You can use IL-5 or interleukin-5 blocking antibodies. Severe, of course, hospitalization, hospitalization is required and treat accordingly. So, that's all about asthma. I hope you have understood the concepts of asthma. We have looked into the pathogenesis, clinical features, morphology, diagnosis and treatment. With this, I have completed all the concepts of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries to ask. Or if you want any topic to be covered, please add a note in your comment. Don't forget to subscribe if you find this channel useful. And if you find this video useful, please do share. Thank you.